Okay, so let's read Revelation chapter 1 together. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take part, take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Cool. Can't you get excited already, can you? To him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day... I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet which said write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a gold sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen. What is now, what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Oh, health warning. The school was running um, a colouring competition. And all the kids had to go away and find something they wanted to draw. And so they got their crowns and they got their, their piece of the paper and the teacher said, right, okay, go, you've got 20 minutes. And the kids were doing furious things. Some were drawing pictures of the houses, some drawers of their pets and all sorts. And one little boy was like this and he kept on scribbling. And he was going like this and, and, it, and he was he 20 minutes and she said, right, two minutes. And so he carried on doing this and he was getting another one and doing this. And she said, Come on now, you've got one minute. Um, and anyway, the kid's all finished. And this boy was still screaming. He's taking another one and getting... And she said, come on, time is up. He said, one more minute, one more minute. She said, what are you drawing? He says, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, don't be silly. No one knows what God looks like. He said, well, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> you see, it takes a child, doesn't it? It takes a child to accept the reality, to be filled with awe and to have no agenda. And that has been a problem down the ages as the book of Revelation has been read. Too many people come to it with an agenda rather than with an open heart. See, what we are going to understand, and I've named this, I've entitled this sermon, What Do We See? Because that's all I could think of. What we need is a vision of reality. You see, in these days when nothing is taken as read, 
The Christian church now more than ever needs to dig deep into God's word. It needs to find the absolutes that God has laid down in regard to morality. In regard to ethical standards. In regard to righteousness. And the certainty of hope that is missing. The one ingredient that's missing in the life of so many. And as we went through our, our intercession prayers this morning. There's a sense that the world has no hope. Now we're not sitting back proudly saying well we've got it. We're just wanting everyone else to have it. And a major problem is that in our society, there's no realistic concept of a personal God who is interested in the welfare of his creation. And this is nothing new. You know, years ago, I was listening on Radio Scotland. If you can get Radio Scotland digitally, it's actually a very good station. And there was a debate going on. Cardinal O'Brien at that time had made some comments about the need to re-Christianise our country. And those comments, of course, have been repeated in various places. And something that was said proved the confusion. Clearly folks say that they believe, but they're not sure what they believe in anymore. And in the part of the debate I listened to, there was a, these Christian callers that came on. You know, you always get the nutter, don't you, who comes on, and they want to, they want to, do, to say something and make a point. And some of these folk shouldn't be allowed, you know, because it gives a wrong picture. It should be thought out and prayed through first. And, of course, these radio stations are looking for a response of some kind, a knee-jerk reaction. That's exactly what they got. And all they would talk about is a point of doctrine and not about a relationship to Jesus. And I believe that's indicative of a church that it's lost its way. The Christian church too often has just lost its way trying to be attractive, trying to pull things off a shelf, trying to be other than that what they are. We have to realise that actually we are a unique group with unique gifts and God has got a particular way in which we will reach the community in which we live. And we've just got to make sure our agenda is right and make sure we put him first so that what we do is what he directs and not just a tick box on our list. Or as um, Chris was saying yesterday, the Delia Smith approach. I rather like that. See, a glimpse at Roman society at this time when the book of Revelation was written reveals an incredible mixture of spiritual anarchy at that time. And in spite of the fact that there, weren't, there, were, that there were harsh penalties for those acting against the state, that there was relative order going on, there was no sense of hope in a future sense in Roman society. Because people live for today. They lived, they loved, they died, and they mourned. And there was a desire to accumulate wealth. Often there was street crime, often there was mugging, and there was a, a problem in most provinces with murder. It sounds kind of up to date, doesn't it? And added to this, there was a persecution of Christians simply because they spoke out against the state and the levels of morality that was accepted as normal. And they insisted that God and his law were supreme in their lives. And I honestly believe these days are going to come again, as surely as the decline in the moral standards of our own society just continues on, and people live for themselves. People do what they want. Now, we might say there's nothing new under the sun, and there's a view that says, well, the world goes around, time marches on, and it doesn't matter what noise we make, nothing will change. Well, that, of course, is just a, a fatalistic view of a world that's lost in its cynicism. And it's a picture, or should I say an indictment, on the Christian church that has failed to live and preach the gospel that really is the most incredible gift of God. It's a bit like that old advert, isn't it? Remember that advert? If you don't vote, you don't do anything? Well, let me put it another way. In a Christian sense, if you don't act on your relationship to Jesus and his word, well, then you believe nothing. You know nothing. The reality check needs to be engaged soon, or the Christian church, certainly in this generation, will be forever trapped in the spiral of pretense, and we will end our days thinking that we've been fruitful in our flurries of activity, when in actual fact, a whole generation has missed out because we are too self-centered and far too prescriptive with the treasure that we have. And this was being touched on again yesterday. Just how big, how real is your God? What do you think his business is really about? 
And I wonder, is our service and our discipleship, is it two-dimensional or is it three-dimensional? Is it black and white or is it in colour? Wasn't it Martin Luther who said, there's nothing so ugly as flesh trying to be spiritual? Because you see, real spirituality has an outcome. Now through John, his disciple and his close friend, the resurrected Jesus conveys this message to the churches in Asia when it seems that giving up or compromise with the world's attitude was actually more preferable than the persecution that was actually grinding them into the dirt. They were having a tough, tough time. And I read that Christians at this time caught worshipping were given the opportunity to repent and were taken to a place of idol worship and they had to make an offering to prove their allegiance to the idea of many gods and to society in general. And if they would not do that, the penalties were harsh and often they lost their lives. And it brought to mind that post that used to be banded about. You remember there was a popular event in the 80s, I think it was. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Do you remember that one? Very, very powerful. You see, in focusing on the risen Lord Jesus, this is a pastoral letter encouraging the believers to understand the meaning of their repentance before God in turning away from their sin and looking through those difficulties on into eternity. You see, having faith, now faith is what? Being sure of, come on, what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. Burn it into your soul, friends. Looking beyond. It's, all, it's so important, you see, for our sanity and survival. We have to have our eyes beyond all the time. And constantly, John speaks of the blessing to come to believers. And if you read on in Revelation, it's this great revelation to God in his church. Listen to this. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Isn't that fantastic? Has anyone read that book, 45 Minutes, uh, 45 minutes in Heaven, or 90 Minutes in Heaven? Have you read it? Oh, it's a must read. It's a great book. It's American, of course, but, you know, great picture of this guy who actually gets badly injured and killed in a car crash. And he's been dead for 90 minutes, been declared dead. And some friends of his come, up, his come upon him. And this guy, who's another Baptist minister, is in the car, and the guy's really smashed up. And the police have let him in because he'd been a medic in Vietnam. And he said he felt this really odd sensation. And he felt that God was saying to him, we've got to pray for this guy. And he said, we went against everything he believed. But he prayed for him. And suddenly the bloke woke up and started singing a hymn. And he'd, gone, he'd been gone for 90 minutes. Now, when he recovered sufficiently, and, and actually the book is more about his recovery and dealing with suffering. Actually a fantastic book in that respect. But he actually talks a little bit about actually reaching heaven, about meeting people, about getting outside the city. He saw a city, but he wasn't allowed in. And he talks about the sound and the colour, and I'm not going to tell you any more, but it's a fantastic picture. I was looking at my shelf. I think I've given it away again. But you know, I keep buying a copy and giving it away. But, you know, it's, it's a great picture. He said, when he talks about the sound, he said he could hear all the songs and the prayers and the conversations that people were having spiritually, all at once, in different languages, and he understood every single word. Now, isn't that amazing? You know, blessed are those who wash their robes and they are made the right to the tree of life and go through the gates of the city. Now, he says he just wanted to go. He saw folk that he knew. He recognized things, but he said, no, you're not coming yet. We're expecting you soon. And he woke up in his physical body and he was so disappointed to be back. But now he has a life's ministry of telling people about heaven. Well, actually, friends, we don't have to go through that experience and be dead for an hour and a half to tell people about heaven, do we? Because we're alive now, aren't we? Yes. yes yeah. You don't sound very alive, actually. <laughs> the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. You see, the Bible, the health warning, but the Bible is the window in this prison world through which we look into eternity. Isn't that fantastic? Now tell me you don't want to do your quiet time. Because the Bible is a living book. 
sharper than any two-edged sword. And of course it will challenge you. Of course it will correct you. But it will guide you and lead you to eternity. It will give you hope for the present, hope for the future. It will reassure you of the promises of the past. A vision of reality now and that which is to come. And then, of course, we need a vision of meaning. Now, John is, is clearly anxious that the church, get, church gets it and understands the message of hope that God is passing on, of an eternity filled with glory, unimaginable peace, and they need to get it because the time of suffering was coming. Jesus is preparing the church, and we know from history that many would suffer, many would be martyred. Just read Hebrews chapter 11. You'll see how they suffered, all for owning the name of Jesus. That is the cost. The purpose here, however, wasn't just to offer them some kind of Dutch courage to say, it'll be all right in the end. Listen, tell someone who's standing at a stake being ready to be burned. Don't worry, it'll be all right. You know, it'll all pan out in the end. How ridiculous is that? But we satisfy ourselves with that, saying, oh, we must endure, we must endure. That's not how God works. He helps you to endure. But while you're enduring, he helps you to see beyond. That's why those who were being burnt at the stake could cry out and see the heavenness. Their eyes were opened and the spiritual realm, which is just outside our ken, they could see it. And the glory of it all, it just was beyond the flames that were licking around their feet. The church needs to realise the nature of life, be that by suffering or otherwise in its place in the eternal purposes of God. In effect, God is saying that although each of us is different, our personalities and gift, gift, giftings are given to us so that we can know him together. And together we can see the hope and the purposes so much more clearly. You see, all our experiences, be they good or bad, positive, painful, they draw us together and they draw us closer to him. But remember that each of us has a purpose. You can't hide. Was it John Henry Newman who said, God has created me to do a definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told in the next. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. There's the affirmation of each and every believer in personal relationship to Jesus, but also the encouragement to realize that all together we get to know him and we build his body. And we become that organism that makes a difference in our world, that living organism. And what I was saying in prayers earlier, breathing life. Now, you don't look ready to resuscitate the world yet. You look like you need resuscitating yourself. Come on. This is the kind of faith and drive that John expects to see in the lives of the church as God has revealed something of eternity. It's a message of optimism, even though the dark clouds of persecution are not too far away. And this revelation tells his people then, and he tells us now, that God has won the ultimate victory over sin and death and hell. And we as his people, in the eternal sense of that description, we reign with Jesus. Now just imagine what this was like for John. It's over 50 years, he's in exile. Jesus has been crucified, resurrected. Now, John was the disciple that Jesus loved. John was the one who witnessed the transfiguration. It was John who was commissioned to look after Jesus' mother. And now John was to see Jesus again before he died and went to heaven himself. John is an old man. He must have been thrilled. But it's more than just a happy reunion. This is a, there's a real purpose, this is, and who better than the level-headed, clear, devoted John to pass it on to the church that Jesus is alive and well. This is John who's been sent away from everyone, so he can't tell everyone, and now he's writing to tell them, don't forget, Jesus is alive. Listen, he says, verse 4, look, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. There's your focus. And from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. God, can't you just feel the enthusiasm just oozing out of his words? Isn't it great? He says, Jesus is alive. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Jesus, the one whom Caesar himself must bow to. And not only the rulers of the world will bow to Jesus, they will bow to every saint because the saints reign with Jesus, as Paul said, seated in the heavenly realms. This isn't some kind of empty power trip he's taken us on, but it's a reminder to us of the sovereignty of the king that we serve and our responsibility to trust him and to be good stewards of the privileges that he has granted to us. That doesn't mean Christians have the right to poke the tongue out of authority. But we do have the right to question him if it doesn't fall within the bounds of honouring God. Now in the face of a world that is declining, with its constant emphasis on self-gratification, with the threat of political mayhem, in a society where the rich increase their wealth and the restrictions of a class system remain, although it's denied as a social and a political embarrassment. Where management grants itself a wage in increase disproportionate to the workforce. And where politicians would sooner go to war than to deal with the desperation of unemployment and poverty on their doorstep. In the face of this, the church, when it engages in prayer and action, needs to know the Almighty God who is in control. Look, verse 7, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Just turn with me quickly to Matthew chapter 27. I'll just read it to you. Let me read it because I'm getting quite excited here. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't even save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped um, insults on him. All of those and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was, who is to come, the Almighty. John's words as one, are ones of demonstration. It's almost like he's carrying a great big placard on his shoulder. Saying, death will not overcome. Jesus will prevail. If only he could have seen that at the crucifixion. In spite of all the odds, you see, John is evoking an emotional response, bringing the believers to a point of hope and assurance. And you know, if you go on and read in Revelation, you see that God is the one who's in control of time and space and history. That he's capable of bringing humanity and human events together to bring about his purpose. And the beauty of this is that God uses the likes of you and me to make, be a blessing and to bring about change. And that's just fantastic, isn't it? You know the story, didn't you, the preacher? Actually, I think it was Spurgeon. He was out walking with a chap he'd met who was a soap maker. And he'd been sharing his faith with him. And as they were walking around, they could see all the negative around them. And he said, what good is religion? Just look around you. What do you see? Trouble, misery, poverty. After all these years of preaching and teaching about goodness and truth and peace, what good is religion with all its prayers and all its sermons if all this evil exists in our society? Well, the preacher said nothing. And they continued to walk, and then the preacher noticed the child playing in the gutter, and he was filthy with dirt and mud and the usual cotton and everything. And he said, look at this child. You say that soap makes people clean, but what good is it? With all the soap in the world, this child is still filthy, dirty. What good is soap to us after all? So the soap maker immediately turned around to him and said, Look, but pastor, soap can't do its job if it's not used. He said, Exactly. And so it is with religion. So it is with the Christian faith. 
It will not accomplish anything unless you use it. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. Come and say it with me. And this is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so no man can boast. For what? We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now that's pretty amazing because actually what most of us think is we get converted and then we have to find a book that tells us what we've got to do next. Actually God's already prepared it. We've just got to ask him. But how many have asked him? How many? Most of us just enjoy sitting scratching our heads and saying, I'm really working hard at this, Lord. Don't work, listen. So it's a vision of reality. And it's a vision of meaning, but there's also a vision of purpose. See, God has got a plan. And we're to be an integral part of it. But the biggest shock to our system is although that we like the idea that we are the best resource that God has got to communicate that to a fallen world. We don't believe it, really. But there needs to be a, a step of faith that the message of the gospel, if the encouragement of revelation is to make any impact on our own lives, if it's going to change the life of the church community, and if it's going to have an effect on the society we're living. It's got to be real. See, the note of assurance is here. Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is presenting to us. I turned round, said John. Look at verse 12 to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned and saw seven lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters and his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. This is literary genius here as he's drawing a picture of the purity of Jesus and yet in his purity is bridging that link and communicating to humanity. Imagine if you can being overwhelmed by the place that you're in. The belief, the mission of your whole life is just laid out before you. And then Jesus in his perfection stands there before you. All the memories of his person. All the imaginings of what he must look like. All the assumptions, they're just swept to one side. And in the nakedness of your spirit, you feel soiled and completely unworthy just to be there in his presence. What do you think your reaction would be? You know, as an experiment once, Isaac Newton decided to see how long he could stare at the sun. So he set up a mirror and he got the reflection and he closed his eyes and opened it. And it really hurt because it could have blinded him. And it was so bad that he locked himself away in the dark for three days. And this is what he said. Because he couldn't stop seeing the image of the sun, he said, I used all means to divert my imagination from the sun. But if I thought upon him, I presently saw his picture, although it was dark. Well, such is the glory and the awesomeness of God. Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for the darkness is as light to you. You know, when we encounter the holiness of God, it leaves an imprint of light on our lives. And rather like Isaac Newton, trying to fill his mind with other things to escape, escape this imprint of light in his eyes, eventually we come back to a time. And we come back to that encounter because once we've encountered Jesus, whatever that means for each one of us, there actually exists there a demand in our lives to do something in response. But be careful. This is a life or death decision. John's reaction to Jesus was this. Verse 17. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you've seen. What is now and what will take place later? The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars in the, are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. See, in these words, Jesus reveals that he is present in the seven churches. Even though life for them was pretty unbearable, God is there. He is the one who will overcome. He is the one who has descended into the realm of death and now holds the keys of Hades. That's the place of the departed spirit. He is present and he is in control. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The next move for John, and I love this bit because this is about us, isn't it? The next move for us is to translate that vision of Jesus into real time with an application to the message that reaches into the soul of the churches and challenges them to rethink their own vision of God and to question the frameworks that they've created for themselves. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 quickly. We're going to read from verse 17. And we're going to read verse 17, 18, and 19. I want us to read it out loud together. No matter what your version, let's just read this and think about the vision. Okay. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. What will you do with Jesus? Let's pray. Oh Lord, as we listen to John's vision, even at the beginning, we recognize just how awesome that must have been. We recognise too how tough that must have been for John as he might have been wondering if he was seeing things and hearing things. But when he saw you, rather like Mary hearing your voice in the garden, he knew it was you. And Lord, we too are in that position often where we find ourselves lost and look at lacking direction. We pray that you'd help us just to be still and to listen for your voice. Grant us, we pray, a vision of hope too. We know our circumstances are so very different from the life of those in the first century. But we thank you that our Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Yes. So grant us the vision that we might serve you well, that we might please you and honour your name. Amen. Amen.